can turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 14. I'm not going to open there, though. I'm going to start in the scripture I referenced last week, and we'll get back into it today. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, it says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Father God, you are good. You are worthy. And we thank you so much for the time and opportunity for us to be here and to be able to exalt you with our voices and with our bodies. God, we want to glorify you this morning. God, we thank you so much for the chance to open up your word of truth and of light and of power. And we pray that you can give us the humility to trust the truth this morning. Soften our hearts, God. I pray that you can use me as a vessel, God. Communicate what you want to communicate to these people, God. And those of us who have ears, please let us hear. Give us your power and your strength this morning to be the people that you're calling us to be. We love you. We thank you for this time. And in your son Jesus' name, we pray all of these things. Amen. 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 Again, good morning, church. Thank you so much. Uh, for being here. Uh, if you're visiting, again, thank you for joining us. If you're watching online, thank you for tuning in. I know I say this all the time, but there are thousands upon thousands of churches in this world, and uh, it's, it's always encouraging to know that you guys have chosen to come and to worship with us this morning. Uh, the ultimate goal, because uh, here's the deal, we are trying to build something beautiful here. Uh, most of us uh, who are committed to this congregation, to this church, this family, we got into those waters of baptism. We said that Jesus was Lord, and we conscripted ourselves into the great mission of building the kingdom of God. But that is not easy work. And as Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful. That means, guys, there's a lot of work and the work ain't going in no time soon. But the workers are few. So our desire, our goal, you know, it's not just that uh, you're here, that, you know, you're going to come and sing songs with us. We want you to come and join the family if you're visiting with us. Come join this wonderful, beautiful mission of bringing the kingdom of God to this dark world. You know, this morning we're continuing on with our Dominion series. The second sermon in the series, that was two weeks ago, was all about how the good beasts in Genesis 1 became the bad creatures in Genesis 3 and 4. And we talked about the war in heaven and the dragon, and the stars that fell with him to the earth to make war on any of us who decided to follow God and love Jesus. The point of that sermon was very simple. There are, in this world, real, dark, demonic forces at work all around us, rampaging in the spiritual realm and influencing us to be people who reject God and devour each other. If we don't recognize the reality of the war that none of us asked for, but we're all a part of, then the violence of that war and the fury of the dark powers will destroy us. This sermon series is designed to help us recognize the threat because it threatens everything that we are trying to be and everything that we are trying to build. If we want to be kingdom builders, then we have to understand there are kingdom destroyers out there. The dark powers are working wisely. They are working wisely and consistently to dismantle 
any good thing that we are trying to build for God. Let me repeat that just for the sake of all of us really getting this into our hearts and into our heads. The dark powers are working wisely with thought, with intention, with bitterness, with consistency to dismantle any good thing that we're trying to build for God. Are you trying to repent from your sins? Are you trying to be a pure man and woman of God? Are you trying to be humble and contrite in heart? Are you trying to be a person or a people who loves other people well, who's empathetic and compassionate? Are you trying to be a good spouse? Are you trying to be a healthy parent, a healthy person? Are we trying to be a healthy church? Satan sees every single one of those things as targets. He hates each of those things so much, and they make him so angry that he will be and is violently hostile toward them. Think about it. I mean, this should really kick us into gear. Satan is violently hostile towards your repentance. He is violently hostile towards your purity. You're wondering why it's so hard. He is violently hostile towards your marriage. He wants to destroy it. He wants you to hate your spouse. Satan is violently hostile towards you treating anybody well and towards anybody treating you well. You wonder why we have so much strife and discord in this world. Satan is violently hostile towards the health and well-being of your children. Do you recognize that? They're not just existing in this world, you know, full of rainbows and sunshines. No, it's Satan doesn't just hate us. He hates our children and he will take them from us. He is working to take them from us. Satan is violently hostile towards this church. Any good that we're trying to do, Satan is trying to make sure we don't get it done. So we, if Satan's going to be wise, if he's going to work consistently, we as a church, as disciples, we need to be wise as well. We need to be alert. We have to know our enemy so that we are not overcome by our enemy. The question is, though, who exactly specifically is our enemy? Today is Dominion Part 3, The Five Kings. We're going to read here in Genesis 14, starting in verse 1. Now, this is a long scripture. It's one of those uh, Old Testament History scriptures, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of names. Don't get confused by the names. And even after I go through it, I'm going to explain it thoroughly. But please try to follow along. If you notice, we rarely ever put the whole scripture uh, up on the screen uh, because we don't want you reading along on the screen. We'll put the reference up there. But we want you to bring your Bibles and to read them. Amen? Amen. It's a good practice that we all should do often and consistently. So please open your Bibles or open your phones, whatever it is. Please read along Genesis 14, verse 1. At the time when uh, Amraphel was the king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Alisar, Kedor Laomer, king of Elam, title king of Goim, these kings went to war against Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemember, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor. All these latter kings joined forces in the valley of Siddim, that is the Dead Sea Valley. For 12 years, they had been subject to Kedor Laomer, but in the 13th year, they rebelled. In the 14th year, Kedor Laomer and the kings allied with him went out and defeated the Rephaites in Ashtaroth, uh, Koranaim, uh, the Zuzites in Ham, the Emites in Shaba, Karithaim, 
and the Horites in the hill country of Seir as far as El Paran near the desert. They turn, uh, then they turned back and went to En Mishfat, that is Kadesh, and they conquered the whole territory of the Amicalites as well as the Amorites who were living there in Hezanon Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Admah, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, marched out and drew up their battle lines in the valley of Siddim against Kedor Laomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, uh, sorry, Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddim was full of tar pits, and when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some of the men fell into them, and the rest fled into the hills. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food. Then they went away. Verse 12, and this is the important part, they also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions, since he was living in Sodom. A man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Anir, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his men and attacked them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions together with the women and the other people. After Abram returned from defeating Kedor Laomer and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is, the king's valley. All right, so... There's a lot going on here. Most of you guys are thinking, what in the world? What, you know, what are we talking about? What's he, why are we reading this scripture? Uh, okay, so there's a few things we got to give context to as we get into this scripture. Uh, this is obviously uh, early Genesis. This is following the story of Abram. Uh, Abram had been called by God. He'd been blessed by God. He was told to leave his father's household. And while he's on this journey, he has a little stint in the land of Egypt. And some of you might remember that story. He goes to Egypt, but he's feeling a little sketched out about how beautiful his wife is and how just oppressive and mean kings can be. So he doesn't want uh, him. He doesn't want to be killed and have his wife stolen from him. So he lies and says that his wife is his sister. And then, you know, Pharaoh doesn't know that. So he kind of brings Abram's, you know, wife uh, to, to sleep with her. And then God uh, starts to just inflict him with all kinds of plagues and damages. And then he's like, what's happening? And he's like, well, that's actually not Abram's sister. It's his wife. And, and God is punishing you. Pharaoh's freaked out about that. He's like, why did you lie to me? Take your wife back. And here, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of riches too, just to make sure you don't come and mess with me again. So... When Abram leaves Egypt, he leaves a lot wealthier than he came. And the scripture said that he had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. And this wealth wasn't just silver and gold, but it was, he had animals, he had livestock, he had shepherds and herdsmen, he had workers of all kinds. Abram's wealth looked more like he was the lord of a nomadic clan numbering in the hundreds. Some people even think the thousands. And they say that his household was that large and he had uh, many, many possessions. And Abram's nephew Lot also had tons of possessions as well. In fact, the Bible says that they were both so wealthy they did not fit on the same plot of land. So there's this little moment in the scriptures where they're like, hey, we're going to have to split up because our clan, uh, the, the possessions that we have, our peoples have become too large. So Lot looks over to the east and he sees all the wealth and the goodness and the lusciousness of the land that's towards the east, towards Sodom and Gomorrah, okay? So he sees what is nice, and he moves over there. Abram's like, look, you can have first pick. If that's where you want to go, that's fine. But then God comes to Abram, and God's like, hey, Abram, don't worry. You're going to go to the west, but I'm going to give you that land, and it will be a land flowing with milk and honey. So even, even though Abram did not see the beauty and the glory of the land, God promised him that he would have dominion over a rich and a luscious land. But we have to note, Lot went over to what he thought were the glories uh, of Sodom and Gomorrah and those kings. Abram went the other direction, 
and was hanging out, it says here, uh, among these great trees with some friends and some other guys who were allied with him. All right. That's where this story is starting. Lot and Abram in two different places. Okay. When chapter 14 starts, dominion belongs to someone else. The land that Lot is in is ruled by a king called Kedor Laomer. For 12 years, he and three other kings with him had a tight, oppressive grip on that area of Mesopotamia. And five other kings were so fed up with Kedor Laomer's oppression that they decided to rise up against him and overthrow him. And so at the Valley of Siddim, the alliance of five kings went to war against the forces of Kedor Laomer. And guess what? Kedor Laomer defeats these five armies. They are oppressed. They want to rise up. They want to fight. They don't like this king's oppression. So they get five armies together to defeat four armies, and they can't do it. They can't do it. And during the chaos of that war, little Lot and all his possessions are just sitting there watching the chaos unfold. And they weren't allied with anybody necessarily, but they were living in the midst of all the warfare. And so as the war is going on, they get swept up in it. And he and all of his possessions get taken away by Kedor Laomer. He, he, he literally gets stolen. He gets kidnapped. He gets captured by this oppressive king. Abram, who had gone west and was saved from the war, he got worried that his nephew Lot had been stolen. So what does he do? He gathers, it says, 318 fighting men from those who were born among his wealth. We know that they weren't his children, right? He didn't have any children at this time, but he was so wealthy that his household had so many servants and he was able to get 318 of the, of the, of the young men born within uh, the midst of his blessings. And he, he built his own little small army and he goes out. Even though Kedor Laomer and his forces had defeated five armies, Abram says, you mess with the wrong guy. And he takes a small band of ragtag warriors and he defeats what five armies could not. All for the sake of claiming his family back. He went to war with an extremely powerful foe all for the sake of saving his family. He defeated Kedor Laomer and his forces by the power of God, and he rescued Lot. So why in the world are we looking at this story? There's a few things I want us to note here as we go through it. First thing we have to note is that Abram and Lot were a part of a war that they never asked for. They were minding their own business, trying to live their own lives. They didn't ask for this war, but the war was upon them anyways because oppressive kings dominated the land. That's the second thing we have to take note of. They lived in a land that was already dominated by oppressive kings. So they were a part of a war they never asked for. They lived in a land already dominated by oppressive kings. And thirdly, we have to take note of the fact that these oppressive kings stole Abram's family. Keep that in mind. This is a story about family, not a story about warfare. The story about Abram caring so much that he was willing to fight the world to get his family back. And that's the next thing we need to take note of. Abram, with strong warriors from his family who were not family by blood, but family by the blessings of God, marched with a unified mission to break the dominion of the oppressive kings and claim his family Back, this story right here, it was a quiet time I had like two years ago. I was reading it. It was blowing my mind. This story right here is what inspired this entire sermon series. 
Abram was caught in the chaos of warring kings and he found his family in danger. And then by the power of God, he fought to save his family. Church, this is the very circumstance we have found ourselves in today. Let me explain. We, church, whether you're a Christian or not, you are a part of a war that you didn't ask for. And you can't escape it. You can't run to the east or to the west, or the north, or the south. Everywhere you go, everywhere you go, this war is waging. We talked about that war last week. We know what that war is, the powers of this dark world. Whether you're a Christian or not, we live in a land already dominated by oppressive kings, spiritual entities who have laid claim to entire swaths of the world. Whether you're a Christian or not, those oppressive kings are working not only to steal your family, but to destroy your family. This isn't fanciful language I'm using here. This isn't a cool interpretation. These are the facts, church. These oppressive kings, whether you follow Jesus or not, have an agenda, and that agenda is the destruction of your life and the life of your family. Now, this part applies to the Christians. Abram, with strong warriors from his family who were not family by blood, but family by the blessings of God, marched with a unified mission to break the dominion of the oppressive kings and claim his family back. Church, that is the church. We are the descendants of Abram, the line of God's glory and God's blessing, those who have been washed with the blood of Jesus, who have been sanctified, who have been set apart, who have been made family, not by blood, but by the blood of Jesus, family by the blessings of God. And God has given us a unified mission to go out into the world and destroy the dominion of darkness. Why? So that we can save our family. Because we are under attack. And our enemy is wise. Turn to Daniel 10. Everything that happens in the world has two aspects. Everything that happens in the world has a physical aspect and a spiritual aspect. Everything exists in two realms, and the physical is what we can see, it's what we can smell, it's what we can, we, what we can feel, it's, it's what our senses experience, it's what we perceive, but the spiritual is more real. The spiritual is what animates everything. A, a, a brother once said in a workshop I was listening to, it was a workshop on the Holy Spirit, and he said that, you know, when the Bible begins... God breathes his breath. He breathes his spirit, his life into clay and creation. And that's what makes things come alive. He says the thing that animates us is the breath of God. It's the spirit of God. He says that means that nothing on earth is animated or living without a spirit. And that means Everything that we do is guided by some spirit. And it's not always the Holy Spirit. And because oftentimes we are not in tune with what's going on in the spiritual realm, we get hoodwinked by what is being manifested in the physical realm. And we end up fighting all the wrong battles because we're not willing to see with spiritual eyes. This is exactly what Jesus is talking about at the end of John 6. When he's explaining to these people, hey guys, this is a spiritual reality. Anyone who wants to follow me must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they're like, don't say that to us, Jesus. We don't understand what you're saying and we don't like what you're saying. So stop saying it. And Jesus says, no. Does this offend you? He says, you need to understand that the flesh counts for nothing and that the spirit is everything. And yet, yet, what do we do? How do we live our lives? We live such fleshly lives, 
lives buried under layers and layers of worldliness and physicality and we ignore what's going on in the spiritual realm but this morning I want to encourage us we have to take note always of what is happening in the spiritual realm because the war is real Daniel 10 verse 1 in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true, and it's concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. Verse 2. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine, touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. Man's was ashy, right? Verse 4. <laughs> on the 24th day of the first month, I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris. I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Ufaz around his waist his body was like topaz his face like lightning his eyes like flaming torches his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze and his voice like the sound of a multitude I Daniel was the only one who saw the vision those who were with me did not see it but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves so I was left alone gazing at this great vision I had no strength left my face turned deathly pale and I was helpless then I heard him speaking and as I listened to him I fell into a deep sleep my face to the ground a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees he said Daniel you who are highly esteemed consider carefully the words I am about to speak to you and stand up for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard and I have come in response to them. Let me stop right there. This is crazy. It's, the scripture starts off, verse 1. It says that a revelation was given to Daniel, and the message was true, and it concerned a great war, and we're going to learn later, it concerned things that were to come. But then it says the understanding came to him in a vision, but then in verse 2 it says that Daniel began to mourn for three weeks. 21 days. It says he ate no choice food and no meat or wine touched his lips and he used no lotions at all uh, until the three were over. So, so Daniel gets this message from God, but then he starts to weep and he starts to fast and he starts to humble himself. And what we learned from the scripture that I just read was he started to humble himself because he didn't understand the message that God gave him. And so what he starts to do is for three weeks, he begins to pray for understanding and he's praying and he's fasting for understanding so before we go any further what should we take from this one the message of God is faithful and true but it can also be complicated or if it's not complicated we can be so worldly that we don't understand it that means that we have to consider carefully the words of God every single day. This should give some serious weight to the thing that we call a quiet time. Because a quiet time is not just you uh, reading the Bible to say you did it or, or to, to, to check off a thing. I did the spiritual thing today. A quiet time is you receiving the message of God as much as you want. But are you considering that message? Are you seeking to understand it? I mean, Daniel had to fast and to pray in order to understand the message. So he's fasting, he's praying, and he doesn't yet understand the message. Three weeks go by, and this is where it gets scary, guys, okay? Three weeks go by, and, and this angel says, since the first day you set your mind to gain understanding and humble yourself, I heard you, and I came, I was on my way, I was coming to give you clarity. In verse 13, but the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. 
<laughs> okay. Daniel is praying and fasting for understanding. And he was not getting understanding because the angel that was coming to give him understanding was being held up by something called the prince of the Persian kingdom. Now, we know this, this prince is not a political prince. It's, he's not talking about the actual, like, human being that was over the Persian kingdom. He is talking about one of those fallen stars that we went over last week. Because he himself, and we learn later in the scripture that this angel, his name is Gabriel. He himself is a burning, blazing, powerful, mighty servant of God. He is so large, so scary, so bright and shiny and flaming that when Daniel saw him, he lost all of his strength and collapsed. The guys who didn't even see him ran away. It's not a human prince that's contending with this physical warrior fire. It's another Elohim. It is a dark power. It is a demon king that is functioning and operating in the spiritual realm. And what does he say here? He says, you prayed. I came to answer your prayer, but something stopped me for three weeks. Church, do you understand what's happening when you pray? Do you understand that you are activating the armies of the glorious God to wage war against the powers that are seeking to tear your life apart? But what's happening if we're not praying? What's happening if we are not begging those powers to come and to stand around us and to put a hedge around us. You know what's happening? We have no defense. And it becomes obvious as to why we can't repent from this thing or why our marriage stays in such a squalor or, or, or why just everything isn't going the way we want it to go because the powers of this dark world are having a field day because we put no priority in the simple spiritual discipline of prayer. You guys might think I'm crazy and that I'm, I'm obsessed with this whole light of the world thing we do. But no, I'm just convinced of the power of prayer. I'm convinced of the power of prayer. So he says, this guy resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief priests, sorry, one of the chief princes came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. The king of Persia, and I guess the prince of Persia, there's, so there's, there's two creatures here now fighting Gabriel. He says, I just couldn't overcome them. But Michael, the archangel, came so that I could go, but Michael is still detained there. Actually, well, let, let's keep reading. He says, now I have come to explain to you what will happen to you and your people in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come. Verse 15, while he was staying, uh, saying this to me, I bowed with my face toward the ground and was speechless. Then one who looked like a man touched my lips and I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I am overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I feel very weak. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone and I can hardly breathe. This is another thing we need to recognize. Even when Daniel got clarity, the message was still not positive. And it was such that he said, wow, that, that, that actually puts me in even more anguish, God, angel. And he says, I, I have no more strength. Church, here's the deal. We can get so confused often thinking that God is here to just make everything good. And, well, he is. But on his journey to make everything good, we got to go through a whole bunch of nonsense and bad. Because we're a part of a war that we, had ne we never asked for. And sometimes even when we pray and even when we get clarity, the message is not going to be what you want it to be. But the answer and the message is going to be what needs to happen. And we need to reconcile ourselves with that. And if it is something that we feel like we can't do or we feel like we're not ready for, listen to what the angel tells him. He says, my strength is gone. I can hardly breathe. In verse 18, again, the one who looked like a man uh, touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid. You who are highly esteemed church, do you realize that you're in the same boat as Daniel? Highly esteemed by God. You were the ones with the Holy Spirit. You were the ones chosen. You were the ones highly esteemed. And the angel is touching our shoulders. And he's telling us, do not be afraid. He's telling us, 
peace. Be strong. Be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened. I love that. And he said, speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. So the angel said, do you know I have come to you soon? I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except for Michael, your prince. So he says, look, I got to tell you this message. And then I got to go because Michael is sitting there fighting the king of Persia and the prince of Persia. But soon he's going to be triple teamed because the prince of Greece is coming. So I have to go and I have to help him continue to fight those demons. So let me just tell you this message real quick. Obviously, this story is vastly different from the one in Genesis, but what do they have in common? Here, we have the prophet Daniel. He gets a vision, but he doesn't understand it, so he prays and he fasts for three weeks until an angel comes to him, and this is what the angel tells him, and it's, it's everything that I just explained, right? I, I came to you, but I was resistant, and I gotta go back says, because we are fighting these principalities, we are fighting these demons. These Elohim, they have power over entire kingdoms and over, uh, over entire nations, and they practice their influence on these nations. This is something that we have to understand, church. There is no group, no kingdom, no nation that has not already been claimed by some dark power. You see, we may not have actual physical kings running around waging war, stealing our families like in Genesis 14, but there are powers and principalities out there ruling in the spiritual skies, claiming dominion over our nations, our cities, our towns, our neighborhoods, our families, and even our hearts. And I want us to think about something, church. When something is under the influence of a demon, whether it be a nation, a city, a town, a neighborhood, a family, or even your heart, the fruit of that influence will always be sin, chaos, and death. I mean, imagine the amount of sin, chaos, and death that is produced when a demon has sway over an entire nation. And we see this all the time through history. You know, I, I read a book earlier this year called Bonhoeffer. It's about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He's a uh, German theologian who was one of the guys who stood up against Hitler's regime. But when you read that book, it is insanity how Hitler was able to sway and influence an entire nation to be so bloodthirsty that they wanted to destroy an entire race. But think about it. I mean, this wasn't like a political warfare type thing where he was just trying to, to conquer. He did want to conquer and he wanted to conquer the world. But usually in those types of situations, you know, you go out and you kill the fighting men. You kill the, the soldiers, the ones who take up arms and they're trying to defend. But once you kill the soldiers, what do you do? You might enslave the rest of the people. You might even incorporate them into your empire or whatever. You, 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 you take them into yourself. You destroy the fighters and you enslave the people. Hitler said, no, that's not enough. I want us to wipe out from the face of the earth every man, woman, and child. I mean, this got to the point where an entire nation was nodding their head when the Jews were marched off into concentration camps, guys. And this was you, your mama, your auntie, and all your little kids being murdered. And it was like once the war was over, it was like scales lifted from people's eyes. Like, hey, what were we just doing? How did that just happen? It's because... Human beings are susceptible to the dark influence of demons. And there was a demon that had laid claim to Germany. In fact, it laid claim to the whole world. I mean, what, that was World War II. Everybody had been stuck in a maddening frenzy of killing everybody else. What demon has laid claim to America? You ever ask yourself that question? I guarantee you it's not the nation of God. I can promise you that. No nation is, except for the kingdom of God. Is it mammon? Money, wealth, and greed? Is that the demon that has laid claim to America? 
Is it the demon of Corinth that says, I have the right to do anything? Is it the demon Molech, the eater of our children? Is it the God of the Moabites who entices us into lust and perversion? Who claims America? Maybe it's the God of hatred and discord that wants us to kill people who aren't like us. What darkness has laid claim to your neighborhood? Last year, an 11-year-old boy was shot in the head just a few blocks away from my house because there are dark powers that have gripped the neighborhoods around me. Maybe for your neighborhood, it's not violence that rules, but maybe it's greed. Maybe it's money, maybe it's apathy. I don't know what it is, but you do. What creature lurks at the door of your home? Which one is peeking into your windows, crouched under your dinner tables? Which one is reaching from under our beds? Is it hatred? Is it cold love? Is it fits of rage? Is it pride? Is it infidelity? Is it neglect? This is what I do know for sure. Powers and principalities currently have dominion over this world. And like we talked about last week, they are furious and they want to destroy our families. The dark princes and the evil demon kings of the spiritual realm are constantly at war. They fight to hinder our prayers so that we stay confused and lost. They fight to steal and devour our families. They fight to shipwreck our faith and defer our hopes. And I can't possibly name or identify all of the nefarious spirits and raging demons that have staked their flag across the world we live in. But over the next five weeks, I want to spend time speaking against the five demon kings that I believe are the biggest current threat to destroying this family and shipwrecking our faith. I don't have the Hebrew and Greek names of these fallen Elohim, but I know them well. This is the moment in the sermon where Cody says, Perry, you made this up. Listen. <laughs> I know these demons well. And you do too. We have each seen them in our own lives, in our own hearts. We have seen them in our D times, in our quiet times. We have seen them in the senseless arguments that we have with each other, with our spouses. We have seen them in the way that we are ostracized from church, in the way that we are bored here, in the way that we don't care anymore about the word of God. We have seen them in all the small places. We know them well. These are the five kings that I believe are waging war against this church and God's kingdom here in America today. I'm going to list them through, and this is what we're going to be preaching about for the next five weeks. We're going to have a sermon for each one of these. The first one is a demon I call the zeitgeist or the spirit of the times. This is the demon that teaches us that culture is more powerful than the cross and that the word of God does not endure forever but changes with the times. The second demon is the homewrecker, the demon that makes us fight and hate our spouses instead of our own sin. This is the one that ruins our children with our own godlessness and stills them away with the love of the world. There's the hunger this is the demon that teaches us to fill the God-shaped hole in us with everything that claims to gratify. That's sex, that's money, that's power, that's respect. It teaches us that the flesh counts more than the spirit. There's the discord. This is the demon that teaches us to be okay with disunity. The one that takes every dividing line, race, class, culture, character, and teaches us to idolize those things over the new creation that Jesus bought on the cross. And then finally, there's the lost dream. This is the demon that takes all of our failures, all of our guilt and shame and exhaustion from fighting the good fight and teaches us to give up because the proper time to reap a harvest will never come. These are the five monsters 
that I believe we are facing on a daily basis. And honestly, they're the five demons that are doing some serious damage to this church and the kingdom of God. We cannot be kingdom builders if these five kings keep tearing down that kingdom. You need to see your enemy. Recognize your enemy. Know them well. Do not give them a foothold. I'm going to close out here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I started here, we'll end here. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You know, in the story of Abram, in the war against Kedor Laomer, you see two types of people. There was Lot who was enticed by the beauty of the world and set up his life near the tents of the wicked where the evil kings had their dominion. And Lot gives us a very clear example of why and how we become people who fold under the dominion of the demon kings, love for the world. The kingdom of God must be a counter-cultural superpower. Satan is crafty. He does not have to destroy us outright if he can destroy us by enticing us, luring us in, making us comfortable with the culture that slowly but surely erodes our moral fiber until we can no longer tell the difference between right and wrong. If we are people who love the world, we will always be lot in the story. If we are people who love the world, church, we will always be lot in the story, powerless against the dominion of darkness and swept away by its strength. And then there was Abram. He was set apart. He was holy. He was a man who lived his life by following the word of God and calling on the name of the Lord. Abram gives us a clear example of what it looks like to be a man of God who cannot be oppressed by the dominion of darkness. In the scriptures and in the kingdom of God, church, there are some men and women who cannot be oppressed. Who are these people who cannot be oppressed? They are people of the word. They are people of prayer. They are people who live by the might and glory of the kingdom and his king. These people, these people of the cross who have been bought and washed with the blood of Jesus have been given a new family by the blessing of God. And together, like Abram, they will gather those who believe in God's dominion, those who cherish the family of God more than anything else in the world, and they will wage war against the demons that threaten our children. We, church, are those people. Those who cannot be oppressed. And yet sometimes we let the darkness oppress us. Remember who you are, disciple, Christian. Remember the spirit that God has given you. Abram was safe and living in an area that was not in the middle of violence because he listened to God. Lot was not. Abram left his safety and comfort in order to fight for his family. This should emphasize for us the importance of family and the importance of who we are fighting for. Note, Abram was already saved and safe. We have to get to a point where we know and trust that we're already saved and safe that we've repented, that we've moved to a place of being workers in God's harvest field. It's not just for our individual salvation church. We're fighting for something a lot bigger than us. We're fighting for us. 
for our physical families as well as our spiritual family. We're fighting for the church, but we'll only have the conviction to do that if we recognize that the church is worth fighting for. We each have to have a conviction that this is our family given to us by the blessings of God. And though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The enemy we fight attacks our heart and our minds. The enemy we fight builds strongholds of Christless knowledge and pillars of ideas that darken our hearts and make us make our thinking futile. But God provides super weapons that shatter nightmares and break anxiety. These weapons, the scriptures and the prayers and the disciplines that summon the spirit of God who cannot be conquered but conquers all, for we know that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. These weapons will vanquish lust and hate and lies and lovelessness. These are weapons of righteousness that bring peace and reclaim shalom they heal the nations and the cities and the towns. They heal our families and the generational curses that the demons have used to enslave us for generations. Jesus gives us these weapons, church. And through the cross, we become empowered with the only power that has any power. The stronghold smashing Strong man binding, curtain tearing, earthquaking, life changing, Holy Spirit. Are you ready to take captive every thought to that spirit? We are kingdom builders, but our enemy wants to tear our kingdom down. So let us together as the family built by the blessings of God, wage war. Let's demolish the strongholds of the five kings by the blood of the lamb and the word of his testimony. Let's pray now for the bread and the cup. Father God, I pray that you can help us see what is really going on. And we can think about moments in history like 2020 and realize that the reason we all faltered and failed is because we were unwilling to see what was happening in the spiritual realm. Open our eyes, God, and help us to be people who are humble enough to rely on you, to practice the spiritual disciplines, to become sensitive to who you are and your spirit within us. Help us to remember that we were bought at a price. And as we take the bread and the cup now, God, help us understand that through your son's sacrifice, his broken body and his blood shed for us, God, that we can be transformed and given the powers that demolish all the dominion of darkness so that this world can know the power of the kingdom of light. We love you so much and we thank you for this time now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.